So we're here with Helen Rasmus from Paragon. Um, and Helen, tell us, you've got a project you're really excited about. Uh, we, we're interested to hear about it. Yeah, and the project that got us talking was really an office building in Apollonia City in um, Ghana. Apollonia City is a new, um, let's say, city development outside of the capital Accra, about 35, 40 kilometers northeast. We've been looking at opportunities there for a while and um, about one and a half years ago, we entered a competition against other architects for really an office building, which is speculative in nature, but also would include the head office for Apollonia City itself. Um, and so, yeah, we, we won that competition Then there was a long development period. Then of course, COVID happened where everybody rethinks office spaces, but um, we finally going into construction literally this month. Oh, fantastic. Um, yeah, with, with the first office building in what is a new city. So it's a bit, um, yeah, feels quite, uh, feels quite pioneering. <laughs> so, so what is it about yeah. the project that excites you most, Tenen? Look, uh, I, I think, um, I think the, the, the combination of the client, the people we are working with, the funders behind it, the, um, you know, Apollonia City is one of a number of new cities being developed by a group called Rendeva. Um, we also work with Rendeva in uh, Tartu City in Kenya. And these new city developments are certainly of interest. They, they you know, when one can debate any project in the world about whether it's good or bad in its intention, but the um, process or the idea of developing new city centers with proper infrastructure from scratch outside of the generally deteriorated centers of African cities certainly has merit. And so these projects are, you know, Apollonia City is one of a number of projects that we involved in that look at these new city centers where new um, ways of working and new lifestyles can be delivered. Um, you know, it's, 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 and, and it makes sense in terms of business, the efficiency of business and the, and the kind of building reliable centers where business can rely on certain things being in place so that you don't have to spend half your life for keeping the light switched on and making your own water. Mm -hmm. And so that's really exciting. The, so, so the combination of people just the opportunity and the and this reach is quite exciting. The building itself, of course, we're happy with the design, but it's a fairly small building, really, kind of in the middle of nowhere, a corner stone in an urban plan that will probably take 15 to 20 years to fill out into a piece of city. But exciting stuff. Yeah. Good. So tell us a little bit about the, the design um, of spaces like this post-pandemic with a focus on wellness and, and that whole live, work, play environment. How have things changed um, as a result of COVID? Look, uh, I, think, I think it's still a fluid landscape. I think um, obviously, I mean, we, we have an interior design business as well. And in that interior design business, um, we are being asked a lot of questions by clients. A lot of the tenants we have previously placed in buildings are rethinking this. Um, in relation to this building in Apollonia, it's a fairly robust little building because it's, um, you know, company sizes vary and in markets like Accra, your smallest average corporate rental is probably 250 square meters. So office buildings we design in places like Accra um, are probably basically laid out for companies between 250 and 450 square meters footprint. So that's quite a different um, landscape from city economies like Joburg or even Nairobi or Kenya. Um, so this building is, is obviously designed to accommodate down to very small pockets. In small pockets like that, the risks are smaller, smaller companies manage themselves more adequately and cross-contamination is not such a big issue. Um, obviously in office design at a larger corporate scale, there are whole other issues just in terms of the numbers of people, the number of services, the, the amount of parts that cross daily. Um, I, I think last year, um, 2020 was a year of emergency management. We all dealt with emergencies of a personal and business kind 
this year is probably the year of permanent change where people have to make decisions about what they're going to do. What we see is, uh, is obviously a rethinking, I think a broad acceptance that more flexible work strategies are fine. Again, this differs from industry to industry. You can't very well run a call center from 500 home offices. Like certain office activities fall apart and can't be very well done remotely. Also depends on the nature of training, the level of management that people need. But at a design level, we are certainly seeing more collaborative spaces, more freeing up. I think the, the push that was there from the perspex makers of this world to say, we're going to take all these open plan offices and cut them up into cubicles and we have the perspex to do it, I think is thankfully not happening. I think there are obviously little solutions for everything. But um, broadly, there's a, there's a bigger push towards um, fresh air cross ventilation, um, open workspaces, garden meeting spaces, terraces, you know, what used to be a smoker's terrace, which was always contested is suddenly an um, open air collaborative, safe wellness uh, meeting space. So I think um, the new office buildings that we are doing um, that are not built yet, we work extensively on roof terraces. I think the, the idea that people work in the open air is quite feasible. Again, depends on climate, gets problematic in Accra, it's pretty sticky, gets problematic in Lagos. But why wouldn't you have open air workspaces in Joburg where the climate's quite mild in Nairobi? So that um, broadly wellness is being taken seriously. Obviously on the technology front, there's all sorts of um, touch-free applications, smartphone applications. Those things talk to smart buildings and smart cities. But, you know, practically, you've still got people working with people. So um, there's a large number of approaches and a, I think a huge number of opinions. And it's still quite early to draw conclusions, but certainly everybody's looking. And I think better and worse solutions will develop. They're being implemented now. Mm. Um, densities can't simply be changed you can't simply just spread everybody out because the property component of making everything can't suddenly increase in cost and the other trends are of course that people are decamping homes so i i think many many corporations will have smaller and smaller um corporate office footprints for sure so, so there's no doubt that corporations across the world will use less floor space. Um, that's for sure. Um, how on the remaining space that's there, I think people will be nervous for a long time and money will have to be spent on different and more flexible furniture. Um, I think there are already fantastic furniture projects in the market. They've just been reserved for funky kind of collaborative breakout areas, but they're going to become more mainstream. Um, and maybe that's a long answer to a short question. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks. Thanks for that, Henning. It's always great to, to get insight. Um, just yeah. coming back to, to the new office development in, in Apollonia City, can you give us a little bit more insight into the use of steel and how it features in this design? Um, well, it's, it's a pretty conventional, um, uh, let's say, concrete and reinforcing building. Um, the, so so um, steel construction in Accra is not an easy thing to do. There isn't a large fabrication industry, so one can get steel elements, but the processing of steel elements into finished components or architectural components is not an easy one. Then Accra is a coastal city. Well, Apollonia is not on the coast, but much of Accra is very close to the coast. And galvanizing is not a strong thing. Galvanizing is very expensive. So in this building in Apollonia, there are, they are, let's say, hidden steel elements. We have got some external staircases and a vertical kind of feature on the building, which really is a, is a mask-like vertical pin that the whole building is anchored around visually and um, that will probably be carried out in steel construction. The um, glazing systems will need steel reinforcing elements and there's, there's a portion of, of curtain wall 
And then um, we are looking at a, at a perforated steel um, second skin part of the facade will be a decorative sunscreen that creates a second skin. That will be a probably a powder coated mild steel element of some kind. I think aluminium is tricky to access and to transport and to get fixed in there. So it's more on the on the cladding elements. The, the building structure itself is conventional. Most contractors in Ghana are very good at putting up structures. It's often in the finishing trades that things get more difficult and um, buildings take longer to finish. But conventional structure, um, frames, ring beams, columns, infill block work are quite usual in Accra, yeah. Good. So in terms of Paragon's work in, in other African countries, how, how has that evolved over the last couple of years? Tell us a little bit about what you've been doing in the rest of the continent. Well, um, yeah, I mean, I've, I've, for my sins, I started working in places like Angola in 2002. It was kind of really through a guy I knew, and then one goes along. I'm better at languages than maths. So I started look, teaching myself Portuguese. Then we had a business in Brazil from 2008 to 2014. I'm very glad now that we're no longer in Brazil, but it was quite exciting for a while. Um, but since 2012, I've been as one of two founding directors in Paragon, have dedicated my working life to working only in Africa, only outside of South Africa. So I have a small number of, of Joburg based clients, but most of my life force has gone into exploring this and the opportunities have been all over we took a you know one can take two strategies when faced with a continent of 58 countries or whatever you can you can um, focus on two or three countries but then you have concentration risk and any one market is all markets in Africa are quite unstable. The economies are unstable, even if politically the countries are stable. Like Uganda, for example, is politically stable because it's had one president for 40 years and will probably have him for another 10 years. But the economy is sort of unstable amongst other things because I think that president talks things up and talks things down and talks things up and talks things down in order to maintain political control and make sure that business people don't rise to political prominence and make too much money. So um, I think the um, the general, the, so, so having had the option of focusing on two or three countries and going in in quite a structured way, we took the other decision, which was to go kind of everywhere where opportunity called. and do the shotgun approach and the question is which one is better or was better i have amazingly supportive partners in my business who have given me the space um, to try this and since 2012 i've worked on projects in 23 countries on this continent i've personally traveled to 18 of them we've built architecture and interior projects in 13 countries so but when I say countries, we primarily work in the capital cities. Secondary tertiary cities becomes difficult and messy and the contracting sequence, the contracting skill is worse in smaller cities. So let's say I focused mainly on African capital cities and um, it's been quite a journey. You know, sometimes great successes, sometimes big hidings. Um, generally, West Africa is more enabling and easier and slightly more profitable and kind of, yeah, just, just a number of factors combined to make West Africa quite attractive. East Africa is very competitive, quite tough. Building costs are low, fees are low, payment culture is bad. Uh, contracting contractors in East Africa really hold clients to ransom and the supply lines for materials are incredibly tightly controlled by a number of families. So to work, I mean, we, we have done work in Kenya. We will continue doing it. It is not, you know, it's not a reason not to work there, but the number of factors that uh, mitigate against an easy project success are quite high. So East Africa is quite 
tough. It's worth doing, but it's but it's quite a um, quite a networked economy, and people work very hard in East Africa to keep competition out. In West Africa, when I say competition companies like ours, um, and and there are strong professional networks on the ground and large companies in in cities like Nairobi. West Africa is different, so. That's really what we've been doing. So it's been a broad approach. We obviously need to focus more. So the last three years I've been more focused on certain building types and certain types of clients. We work a lot with in-country local pension funds that deploy projects. Um, so that's been a, a good uh, route to work. And then we find work through other consultants. So there's a consultant community that access that allows me to get access to work. Um, and then we work with property funds from outside of the continent. And then on a sector basis, I think there are obviously sectors that are interesting at the moment. Data centers are a big and important sector of work um, across Africa. Student housing remains a big sector. And then hospitality, maybe unsurprisingly, is also coming back. We're involved in a uh, Safari Lodge in Ghana, which is in construction, and another very large hotel. And I think hospi new hospitality projects are coming back. If you were in a hospitality project that hadn't properly started before COVID, it may be dead now, but new people are coming together to start new projects. That's what we are seeing. So Helen, just a last question from my side, and then if there's anything else you'd like to add, that'd be great. Um, what yeah. what does the rest of 2021 look like for Paragon? What are you what are you really looking forward to? What are you excited about? Um, look, locally in South Africa, there is work. Um, our Cape Town office is growing quite strongly. We started it about two and a half years ago, and I think probably early next year we'll have our first completed new build project in Cape Town, so residential block. Um, and there's a lot of um, lots of things bubbling in Cape Town, so that's going quite well, and it's exciting to, to see the see the acceptance that we're finding in the Cape Town market. Uh, my partner Anthony is working on Amazon's new head office in Cape Town, which is also going into construction now, so that's very exciting. I'm not really involved in that project because I focus on the work outside of the country. Locally, um, more opportunities in data center work um, and also educational work, industrial work. So we have projects, we have a wide range of projects. We've always been generalists. So from schools to um, even some houses, we do houses for certain select clients to, um, to educational work, to residential work. It's a broad range of things. And um, I think the other exciting parts are probably rebuilding working culture in the company. We are bringing people back to the office. And then we are working on a large um, BE uh, shareholder change transaction. We have completed that in our interior business at the age of uh, at the end of 2019, and we're going to replicate that in our architecture business to bring in a new and stronger future level of leaders. We've been at this for at the end of yeah end of next year. This will have been 25 years, so we're coming up to a quarter century, and it's time for quite a bit of change. So. Mm -hmm. I'm personally excited about work that we're going to do on the company, not just on client projects, in terms of renewal of the working culture and processes and to position ourselves as a better working, strong business. We have work, we have clients, um, we have strong relationships, and we need to spend the rest of 2021 looking at the health of the ecosystem around our business. Like, who is left, who's moved where, who, where are our suppliers, how well are people who has still got life force and, you know, who's been broken, who's given up, who has moved where. So we really need to look at um, where we, yeah, re, re, regain knowledge. At the end of 2019, we had a spectacular and huge Christmas party, end of year party. 
with over 800 people at the Victoria Yards in Joburg and we burnt a big sculpture and we did a mini burn party and it was an amazing moment and nobody was really talking about a little virus called COVID. But we had a strong sense that we wanted to celebrate, um, you know, the good things of business and of life with, with, a, with a group of over 800 people. It was employees, their partners, contractors, developers, subcontractors, suppliers, consultants, um, lawyers, whoever works with us. And we need to really go back and see where everybody is. It was this amazing sense of being carried inside of what we called our ecosystem. And I think we need to figure out what's happened to our ecosystem and speak to people. That's it, yeah. Good, so anything else that you wanna add before we close? Mm, um, yeah, I, th I think, look, this, you know, there, there's, there's a lesson that we learned many years ago from one of our clients. Um, through one of our projects, it was a Norton Rose project then before the World Cup in South Africa, and that project started in literally in the week of the Lehman Brothers crash in September 2008. And one of the, you know, there are two ways you can react to a crisis or to external pressure. You can panic and knuckle down the hatches and cut everywhere and slash a project and burn all the costs and kind of cut a thing to the bone and try and survive, or you can use a crisis to do your best work. So what we learned back then from Zenprop was that they took what was then the only big new build project in Santon, they went to their suppliers and consultants and subconsultants and made sure that those companies retained the best people in their organizations as a precondition for doing this building. And then as prices predictably dropped in a depressed market, instead of slashing budgets, um, that client kept to their budgets and actually started acquiring more for the same money because as supplier prices dropped, you could spend more on the same building, given that the feasibility stood. So the lesson out of that is that a crisis can be the time to do your best work and not your worst work. It's a question of how you get out of bed.